Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. Oh, it's such a good day. This is good stuff. It is a good day, and we went to bed really early last yeah. night, really early, but it was good. Um, I think we went to bed like 8 yeah. or something like that, maybe yeah. maybe even earlier. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, after the live that we did, it was like there was an energetic attack, and Cindy wasn't feeling really good, so I had to just run energy on her until she felt good again. Um, and then just took the opportunity to go to bed and just read. And I ended up reading for probably two or three hours, you know, and uh, going deep into a lot of the Indus Valley literature, which I think holds so many keys to our reality. Because out of it, you know, comes the Vedic line of thinking, also comes Hin you know, not just Hinduism, but Buddhism and Jainism and Shintoism and uh, other other ideologies, not really Shintoism, that's um, from indigenous to Japan, but um, so many other ideologies, they're all saying the same thing. And what we're looking at right here is a scene from Avatar. And you guys may have seen this movie. I think it is the most popular movie of all time. And what they're doing here is they're transferring the consciousness of the hero over on the right uh, in his human body into the body on the left his avatar body. Now his human body is kind of broken and uh, he needs to have a vehicle that would be more conducive to going on. And so it, it's talking about the transfer of consciousness from one body to another. And this was such an excellent movie and it's strange when it came out um, I heard it had bad reviews, so I didn't even bother watching it until, I don't know, not very long ago. And then after I did watch it, it just, everything clicked into place. Not everything, but a lot of things clicked into place. Another thing you see is those little glowing, uh, they almost look like they are jellyfish flying in the air. And really, they're, they're like prana. They're like life force that's given off by this amazing tree. Uh, and that's a cute little uh, analogy as well. Um, I see, and Cindy sees too, uh, life force smaller than this, but not dissimilar than this everywhere. Everywhere I look, I see, the, I see it you know, just swimming around in the ether. So science, and you know, obviously we have a, a backward world here. We have a world that is in disharmony uh, you know, because of the structure that governs it and you know many people view science in a negative light and then others view it in a positive light um you know really science is just all about experimenting and and getting down to uh you know what is the truth of things quote unquote the problem is of course when these studies are funded by corporations that have agendas that are often all about controlling ideology controlling philosophy and controlling money and power we don't always get you know proper studies and thus proper science that's very true you know everything that we thought we knew a year ago has been completely changed but i think that has to do with a little bit of disclosure it's like something is forcing them to tell us some more truth partly i think it's us waking up and, you know, and also I think it's also others, um, perhaps even non-human entities that are helping to create a bridge to a new reality that's going to allow us to blossom. The prevailing consensus in neuroscience is that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain and metabolism. When the brain dies, the mind and the consciousness of the being to whom that brain belongs ceases to exist. In other words, without a brain, there can be no conscious. But you know, this, if we look at the traditions that we're talking about, as well as other traditions, is inherently uh, backwards, completely. And now things are coming out in science that are showing that that is a completely wrong way to look at things and just totally, totally incorrect. And we see, according to a decades-long research of Dr. Peter Fenwick, a highly regarded neuropsychiatrist, who has been studying the human brain, consciousness, and the phenomenon of near-death experience, NDEs, for 50 years, this view is incorrect. Despite initially being highly incredulous of NDEs and related phenomena, 
Fenwick now believes his extensive research suggests that consciousness persists after death. In fact, Fenwick believes that consciousness actually exists independently and outside of the brain as an inherent property of the universe itself, like dark matter, dark energy, gravity. Hence, in Fenwick's view, the brain does not create or produce consciousness, rather it filters it. As odd as this idea might seem at first, well, it doesn't seem odd to me. Um, And then again, when we get down into, quote unquote, being educated and getting degrees, you know, so often, besides, yes, taking in some, some knowledge, there's also societal conditioning that comes along with it. A rigidity of thinking that and many times and it off it can totally block out the truth and that which would be illuminating to not just the individual that's doing the research but society in general and so when we look at this again the brain is more of a processor you know it, it, it's more of a processor so you know you could look at it as a computer chip you know in a car for instance you know, that's going to enable the car to, to function and have all the systems operating smoothly and efficiently. Um, again, you know, the body is an avatar. We, we learn that from so many of these wonderful traditions. And it's beautiful that there are scientists and uh, neuropsychiatrists, for instance, that are finally, you know, being able to think outside the box and the conditioning they received going through uh, med school and the like, and r- start to realize, hmm, I don't think what I've been taught is exactly right. We could get a better picture. We we can, and the brain is, you know, a processor and it's a receiver, and it takes in the information around us and, you know, outputs our, our supposed reality. So, hence, in Fenwick's view, the brain does not create or produce consciousness. Rather, it filters it, as odd as it might seem at first. There are some analogies that bring the concept in sharper focus. For example, the eye filters and interprets only a very small sliver of electromagnetic spectrum, and the ear registers only a narrow range of sonic frequencies. Similarly, according to Fenwick, the brain filters and perceives only a tiny part of the cosmos' intrinsic consciousness. Indeed, the eye can only see wavelengths of electromagnetic uh, energy that correspond to visible light. But the entire EM spectrum is vast and extends from extremely low energy, long wavelength radio waves to incredible energetic ultra short wavelength gamma rays. So while we can't actually see, quote unquote, much of the EM spectrum, we know things like X-rays, infrared radiation and microwaves exist because we have instruments for detecting them. Similarly, our ears can register only a narrow range of sonic frequencies, but we know a huge amount of others imperceptible to the human ear exists nonetheless. So when the eye dies, the electromagnetic spectrum does not vanish or it doesn't cease to be. It's just the eye is no longer viable and therefore can no longer filter, be stimulated by and react to light energy. But the energy it previously interacted with remains, nonetheless. And so too, when the ear dies or stops transducing sound waves, the energies that the living ear normally respond to still exist. According to Fenwick, it's it's the same thing with consciousness. Just because the organ that filters, perceives, and interprets it dies does not mean the phenomenon itself ceases to exist. It only ceases to be in the now dead brain, but continues to exist independently of the brain as an external property of the universe itself. What's more, according to Fenwick, our consciousness tricks us into perceiving a false duality of self and other, when in fact there is only one unity. Wow, you know, I mean, that's exactly at the core Mm -hmm. of, of so many different belief systems. Ultimately, all is one. And when we die, we transcend the human experience of consciousness and its illusion of duality and merge with the universe's entire and unified property of consciousness. So ironically, only in death can we become fully conscious. Yeah, which is, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing to become fully conscious, but we want to try to understand as much as we can while we're here. So does consciousness pervade the universe? Yes. Yeah, and, and you know, more and more scientists are coming to realize this. 
as we had talked about, there was a group of philosophical scientists that used to get together and have a coffee clutch back in like the 30s, um, including Einstein and Max Planck and so many other of the founders of what became, you know, our modern quantum physics. And what was there? What was their ultimate conclusion is that the universe is mind stuff. It's all consciousness. Uh, thoughts are as real or more real than a chair, a or table, or anything. Thoughts are things for sh- thoughts are things for sure. And w- yeah, without the thoughts, th- there is no things. Curiously enough, decapitated worms regrow heads and keep their old memories. They kept their old memories. Their brains snipped off. They kept their own memories. Interesting, isn't it? And I know a lot of you out there played with worms as little kids. And we see here, out of a semantic scholar, flatworms lose their heads but not their memories. Study finds memories are stored outside the brain. So where are they, where are they stored? Are they stored in the cell membranes or are they stored in some sort of cloud, quote-unquote? Yeah, they're definitely stored in the cloud. Think about that. Think about the analogies that we understand now. You know, how now, you know, in the past, it would have been like impossible for so many of us to wrap our heads around um, how we could have things stored in a cloud in the first place. Well, where's the hard drive? You know, it's got to go somewhere. And just just even the thoughts, like if we go back to the days of the telegraph, you know, that was amazing enough for so many people. And of course, that makes me think of the Carrington event and how things will uh, hit us here when we lose all our power, be it by CME or other means as well. But just, you know, the whole concept of things like this would just boggle the minds of our grandparents. But yet they understood it in days past. And it's so interesting as we see Krishna giving Arjuna a lesson and we see Vimanas flying in the sky in the background because it was a given that there were beings that had the technology that could fly around in the sky. And I was reading about that last night when uh, the Asura, Ravana, steals Sita, kidnaps Sita, who is um, Rama's bride, and carries her away to Lanka. Um, He spotted flying in the sky. You know, so that that gets into a totally different topic and the technology that we've had in the past and that we've lost and forgotten all about. But in this great diatribe in the Mahabharata, Krishna says to Arjuna, you know what the difference is between me and you? I remember all my past lives and you don't. So he has what we would call Mm -hmm. self-realized. He is also an avatar of Vishnu, the preserving force of the universe. And that doesn't mean that there aren't other avatars. It doesn't mean that that doesn't reside within you or I. Um, I was reading last night about Hanuman, and Hanuman is the monkey god. And it's interesting how Hanuman is in the form of a monkey, which is thought to be below humans on the evolutionary scale, And yet he's a demigod at the same time with amazing powers and abilities, can manipulate his physical body, can manipulate things around him uh, because he is self-realized again. And he is thought to be, uh, well, his fathers, plural, uh, are a simian and also the wind god Vayu and also Shiva. So, you know, he's a combination of those things, but we are all a combination of different energies and different forces. Ultimately, again, there is only one consciousness when you get down to it. And so that consciousness is broken down into so many different fractals because it is a fractal universe and a fractal is, you know, basically something that still contains the unity of the whole within it, even though it's a smaller individuated unit. So if we could tap into that and remember who we really, really are, then there's incredible things we could do. Curiously enough, Hanuman has so many boons, which are blessings given to him by various deities and gods, all these different powers and these different abilities. And again, they're relating it in a story sense to us and telling us to wake up. 
and to realize what's latent inside us. Because Hanuman, he doesn't remember all these things he can do. He's, he's kind of got amnesia to the boons amnesia about these super abilities that he can tap into so it's only when somebody reminds him and says something like well you know there goes the bad guy and yeah the bad guy is 100 feet tall you could turn into a giant as well and you could chase him and you're faster than him and Hanuman be like oh yeah you're right and then he'll manipulate his body and he'll be a 100 foot tall giant or 150 foot tall giant you know jump and grab the bad guy so, you know, the stories are allegories, just like the stories are allegories in, in the Bible as well. And it's all pointing to the fact that we have forgotten who we are. And so we, we relate to these bodies and we think that's all that we are, but that's not the case. The body is, again, it's just an avatar for our consciousness. You know, hence the DNA memory. If you see something that fascinates you or if you have an in, a sudden interest, you can bet that you've done that before. And if we go to the Bible, there's a lot of things that, you know, seem incongruous. So this one is from Luke. What do you want me to do for you, Lord? And this is Jesus speaking to um, a blind person. Lord, he said, I want to see. And Jesus said, okay, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And you go try to find one time when Jesus said, I, your Lord God, have healed you. It's not in there. It's not in there because it's our faith. And whether you have faith in Jesus or you have faith in Krishna or you have faith in Buddha or you have faith in, you know, Allah or, or whatever it is, it's your faith. And so there is the line of thought, too, that all gods are one God. Now, they appear in many different facets and forms and serve many different functions. Again, it's what do we relate to? And that gets into archetypes. Mm -hmm. And so it's easier for us at some times of our, our life to feel more akin to a certain archetype. Maybe because of our circumstances, the things we're going through, we could clearly relate to this one archetype. This, this one, uh, well, this one emanation of universal consciousness in a particular form. And that could change over time as well. So Jesus also said, you know, greater things you will do, which how could that possibly be? When he said, I and my father are one, he's talking about self-realization. He recognizes that he's not the body. He's not the body. He's, he's the consciousness which is using the body and operating the body. And he's trying to, to tell us that, you know, God dwells within because he said the kingdom of heaven lies within you. Don't look here. Don't look there. Don't don't look for him to uh, put his f literal foot on Mount Olives, you know, as if he's a giant, you know, because that's how the representation is, because we are all giants on the inside. If we recognize what dwells within us and what we really are, which is we are all that universal consciousness, which abounds the entire multiverse and is just having a individuated experience in an avatar. Yeah, so, I mean, there's just so much to pick apart and so much to understand here. And there's so much that's been misunderstood, too. Completely. So, you and the father, or you and the mother, or you and the all, you see, it, it's all just semantics and terms that we have used. But ultimately, it's all about self-realization. And I read this book, I think, when I was, uh, I know I was young. I was in my early teens or maybe 12. It's The Science of Self-Realization. Um, and there's, there's so many different books you could read. But ultimately, you got to do the work on the inside. That's where the meditation and, and things along those lines lead to the real self-discovery. Not about your avatar, but about your conscience. Your consciousness is... The true you, again, we look back to the movie Avatar, That's we're just swapping vehicles. We're swapping cars. As we, we learn, again, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, worn-out bodies are discarded by the user, just as worn-out garments are by the user. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, there's just so many things to sit and think about. So everything external is something and ultimately becomes you. 
So the knowledge that gets rid of anger, greed, pride, and deceit is real knowledge. It's self-realization and understanding that. And that only comes from going within. It, it's, it's not going to come with any particular dogma. It's not going to do with any sort of individuated right. It, all those things can help us or they can hinder us. It, it all depends on the individual. However, it comes with just the knowing the gnosis, you know, the word gnosis is, is knowing in, in a, an experiential sense. So don't believe anything just because you've been taught it by your teachers, your peers, your parents, the priests, uh, the politicians. you got to learn for yourself and you have to do it by going within. Yeah, and I, it's just so important. And our lives are set up to be so chaotic outside of ourselves, but that's why sitting in quiet meditation can be so, so valuable. Thank you so much for your support on Ko-Fi and Patreon. As always, guys, much love, God bless, and namaste. Namaste.